you know, there's something I really need to repent. <laughs> yeah, me. I got lots to repent about. <laughs> I got lots to ask God to forgive me for. I got lots to get straight, you know. Speaking of straight, there. Maybe that's a little straighter. But I got to admit, you know, especially when Tozer brought it up today in Tozer teaching, when it comes to prophets, I hate them. <laughs> okay, maybe I don't hate them, but they, they get my goat. Urgh. No, I don't mean to sacrifice. I mean, they get my goat. <laughs> Literally. I just, as soon as some person comes running along claiming to be a prophet, first thing I do is go, no, you're not. And you, invariably, I can read something that they posted, and within the first few sentences or paragraphs, they've contradicted themselves. And... If you know anything about contradictions, you can see where one thing they say and then they turn around and contradict themselves in it. That's the Spirit of God telling you by discernment that they aren't what they claim to be. they are got some nice ideas, you know, maybe, and they've got a lot of emotional involvement in what they think. But as far as what they claim to be, you know, like, supposedly like some Elijah because most of the time when I run into these people whoever they may be doesn't matter whether it's in church or it's in you know some visiting some church or or seeing them on the internet or some wacko ministry that's throwing out some flyers they always have something bad to say about something and they either have something too bad to say or they have something too good to believe in you know God's gonna give you money and prosperity and long life and thousands of kids you know and blah 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 <laughs> you know I never once heard one come up and say I want to tell you about Jesus you know Jesus you know the one that is the most important person you know in the volume of the book that says from cover to cover that the volume of the book speaks about Jesus I don't hear prophets telling me about Jesus as a matter of fact I'll hear them talking about the end of the world or Jesus is coming but not the person you know, Jesus the person that sent the Holy Spirit or that asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit. I always find these little gaps, okay, big gaps in their doctrine or dogma or whatever it is that they've gone to these school of prophets or whatever they've done. Because for some reason, they are more like a prophet of man than they are a prophet of God. No offense to them. God help them. So, I appreciate their enthusiasm but they really get on my nerves. <laughs> and like I told you, I need to repent. Because after all, you know, if I compared them to Tozer, oh, maybe I better not. Okay, if I compared them to any other person who's claimed to be a prophet, maybe I better not. You know, that we have factual data that they were an actual prophet of God. Uh, maybe I better not. <laughs> You see, most of these guys that are running around claiming to be prophets, I keep finding what's wrong with them. So, no offense to them, I personally go, eh, when it comes to being prophets. Now, they may be, you know, saved, you know, and I'm sure that they probably are. They may have, you know, good intentions. I hope. <laughs> Uh, as long as you're not sending money, I may be, <laughs> you know. But, you know, I've just seen too much, experienced too much, and know too many people that have had either the gift of prophecy, gift of discernment, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, or ask God, you know, because all of those could be applicable to any point in time. That all you have to do is ask God. Because, to put it bluntly, when it comes to people with all these titles and supposed offices, all you got to do is ask Jesus. You know, he said, if any man lack wisdom, he, in other words, you got a question, you want to know the facts about somebody, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay? It says, let him ask of God. Who upbraideth not? He's not going to knock you down, tear you up, and yell at you, and say you're stupid for asking. But give it to all men liberally. Oh! You mean I only got to ask God, and God will tell me? Well, you see... Let me put it to you another way. Before I tell some of these people that they aren't what they say they are because they claim to be something that they aren't, I ask God, shh, don't tell them. 
That's our little secret. I ask God, are they a prophet of yours? God goes, eh, eh. <laughs> no, no. Okay. <sighs> Blast them. Four barrels. So you see, I really do have to repent because I cheat. I ask God. You know, I go to the horse's mouth first, you know, find out. <laughs> One of yours? No? Okay. <laughs> I'm after them. <laughs> and so it drives me nuts. You know, they always have these wacko things to say too you know like they go so spiritually talking that you read it and you go watch this they're going to hang themselves before they're done talking sure enough boom contradiction to scripture oops I'm sorry you're not a prophet of God you contradicted the scripture you're claiming this and the Bible says this so unfortunately no you don't do that you're not a contradiction to the word of God you are but the word of God isn't so guess what the word of God is <laughs> a more sure word of prophecy <laughs> and so is Jesus ooh Slap me for saying that. Hmm. But we do have a more sure word of prophecy. We don't need prophets. Now, it's true that there are some that have a word at times and some that operate in those gifts. And I have encountered... one or two real ones. Okay, maybe a few more than that. But less than I can count on one hand. Or maybe... Maybe, yeah, but, you know... Maybe. Now, as far as how many I've run into, thousands. Seriously. I've run into thousands of people that claim to be prophets. And that's not really that unusual because, you know, in 30 years of being a Christian, or longer, 35 plus years, and then living in Jerusalem when, <coughs> no offense, but part of the Jerusalem syndrome is you got every Christian in the world, for some reason, the heat gets to them and all of a sudden they're prophesying. You know, they're like, hey, I'm a prophet of God and I'm doing this. And they lock them up, you know, and take them in and give them some fluids, you know, and then they, you know, give them some rest and they get over it. It's called the Jerusalem Syndrome. It's actually chronicled, believe it or not, at Hebrew University and in the hospitals there in Jerusalem because people get carried away in the heat. And because they get carried away in the heat, they get kind of like heat delusional. And so, you've heard of like, you know, the the Helsinki syndrome and the other syndromes, you know, that there are, whatever they are. Well, <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Over in Israel, they actually have a chronicled, proven, documented thing called the Jerusalem syndrome where good and well-meaning tourists who would normally not make some kind of weird statements like that or do something dumb like that, they get over there because of all the heat and excitement and they're all crammed in and all kind of wound up, you know, and doing too much and not sleeping enough and not getting enough fluids. Well, they get the Jerusalem syndrome. <laughs> and I've seen it. Boy, have I. And when I lived there, it was unbelievable. It was kind of like one minute, you know, they'd be like this normal, rational human being. The next minute, they're like, whoa. What did you drink in the Kool-Aid? <laughs> Who spiked your Pepsi? <laughs> oh my gosh. Cut down on their sugar. <laughs> and that's the part of faith that we really should be more realistic about. It should be practical and real, not just this wackiness that, you know, so often you can find too many wackos out there that are really kind of doing a disservice to God, you know, by claiming things and naming things and doing things that really, <laughs> they did it, and it doesn't have a lot to do with God, you know, and sadly, you know, that's kind of what Tozer's talking about, too, you know, it's like, there are a lot of people running around, you know, because they're in the Pentecostal movement, they figure they got to pick some job that they get, and so they pick a lot of prophets, and you know, sadly, on the internet, that's what I deal a lot with. You know, sure enough, I, most of the time I just have to kind of, you know, either delete them or get them off my web pages or sites or whatever because they just start off and go off into tangents. And like I said, you know, if it's true, the Bible, and the Bible said that the Holy Spirit would not speak of himself, but he would speak of Jesus, as Jesus said, and that the Spirit was meant to, you know, convict, convince, and do all these other things, but also to point to Jesus, you know, then... I don't get this whole prophecy thing about being these people weirded out on other weirdo things when they should be practical, like, you know, telling you, hey, it's going to rain tomorrow, you know, or, hey, don't go to work tomorrow, you know, the, the 
sky is falling or you know there's a bomb blast or somebody just robbed the copper from your building and you're going to have no air conditioning. <laughs> oh, that doesn't happen in your neck of the woods? Boy, <laughs> are you lucky. <laughs> you should be where it's hot. They go after copper like it's gold and money. Of course, in the latter days, we're told that bread would be that expensive. And judging by how much wheat and corn just got wiped out by the drought, gold, uh, gold, bread may be more expensive than a small, tiny bag of gold. <laughs> we're not there yet. <laughs> but Tozer, in his teaching, God's true prophets never apply for the job. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? You know, i got to love it. First of all, here's God telling, Oh, Mo, you know, I'm going to send you. You're going to be my prophet. Mo says, Not me, man. Pick Aaron. Not me, man. Pick someone else. Uh, you know, anybody else, but not me. You know, who am I? And I don't find that about other people. It's like... The first thing they want to do is jump up and say, here am I, you know, I'm one, I'll do it. I don't think I'd want that kind of job, you know. Some of these these guys, you know, I was, I was reading this story in the Old Testament about these two prophets, you know, they were in, the, in Israel at the time, and, you know, the young prophet and the old prophet, you read that story? Yeah, you know, the one where the young prophet's told by God to go through the land, you know, and the old prophet comes up to him and says, well, God just told me that you're supposed to come over to my house, you know, tonight and spend the night, you know, and then go in the morning. So the young prophet comes over to old prophet's house, you know, and eats and sleeps, you know, and then gets up in the morning, goes on his way and gets ate by a bear and chewed up by a lion. Dies. Kind of an interesting story, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, there's a moral to that story. Uh, I think there is. You know, you figure it out. Go look it up. It's real interesting. Sometimes I think that we have a lot of young people running around getting carried away. The true minister of the gospel is one not by his own choice, but by the sovereign commission of God. From a study of the scriptures, one might conclude that the man God calls seldom or never surrenders to the call without considerable reluctance. Ask me. <laughs> uh, let me tell you. The young man who rushes too eagerly into the pulpit at first glance seems to be unusually spiritual, but he may in fact only be revealing his lack of understanding of the sacred nature of of the ministry. The call of God comes with an insistence that will not be denied and can scarcely be resisted. Moses fought his call strenuously and lost to the compulsion of the Spirit within him. And the same may be said of many others in the Bible and since Bible times. Christian biography shows that many who later became great Christian leaders at first tried earnestly to avoid the burden of ministry. But I cannot offhand recall one single instant of a prophet having applied for the job. <laughs> The call to witness and to serve God comes to every Christian. The call to be a voice to mankind comes only to the man who has the Spirit's gift and the special enabling. We need not fewer men to show mercy, but we need more men who can hear the words of God and translate them into human speech. Boy, ain't that the truth. You see, these prophets of modern days seem to want to quote condemnation and judgment rather than conviction and comfort and grace. They don't want to extend the mercy of God. They want to extend the condemnation of their own sinful nature that they're vicariously living out in condemning someone else by saying it's God doing it. And the reality is, no, God is not. And they do not have a calling to do that. Because, you see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So they should be reinforcing the message that Jesus has given at any point in time in any of their quote-unquote prophesying. But that's why I know they aren't. Because they don't. Now if they did, then I would be interested in what they have to say because I would be challenged by the reality of a person whom God is speaking through. I've had people come up and tell me lots of things that they said the Lord told them. And I have been interested, you know, in minor ways, but not really serious about it in any major way, because while most of them over the 30 plus years that I have, 35 plus years that I've been a Christian, they've all said pretty much the same thing, and I'm maybe not going to get into it, because it sounds like ego or pride, but 
you know, I've treated it more like, yeah, right, sure. <laughs> okay, fine, you know, I've heard that before. <laughs> you know, and I ignore it. Because until God speaks to you and tells you as a person, God doesn't need to go through anybody else. You know, he doesn't need a donkey to go through to speak to you. He doesn't need a pastor. He can talk directly to you. And God has, you know, to me. You know, and what he told me, I've hung on to for 30 plus years. And what he told me, I do. And, you know, it's funny that Tozer mentions that as far as the call of God. It's kind of like Vidivo. You know, this, this Vidivo ministry has been evolving, you know, in some time because when I was first saved, I ran right out. You know, I ran out and told my family and, you know, told lots of people like a Jesus freak about, you know, God and Jesus and the end of the world and Jesus is coming and things like that. And I was very sincere and very, you know, ooh, out there, you know, and it was wonderful, don't get me wrong, but people got saved in spite of me. Because <laughs> I was trying to blast doors down. <laughs> you know, later on they got saved, but praise the Lord, you know, they got saved, I don't care how they did. But I didn't go into the ministry, you know, and anywhere that I lived and anything that I did and all that I accomplished was <coughs> what people would call ministry, but I never went into the ministry or said that I had a calling from the Lord because I just did what needed to be done. I worked behind the scenes in lots of ministries because I was always trying to figure out, you know, how did these people get this calling or what is, you know, what is all this junk, you know, in their trunk that they talk about? What is all these things that they accumulated, you know, in their life that they keep saying, you know, it sounded so spiritual that I kept going, well, how come I'm left out? <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, come on now, you know, I didn't have a spiritual upbringing. I didn't grow up in the church, you know, I kind of came at it late. Well, you know, I was 17, but you know, anyways. And, um, but didn't have any church background. I didn't grow up in the church, didn't go to church, had never been in church, didn't understand church, didn't know what it was, you know, I had to find out the hard way. And then I had to find out all about the bigger church at large, you know, and now that I have a ministry that goes to the world at large, and Vidivo now is like, you know, <laughs> in a whole lot of countries, you know, <laughs> ooh, that's cool, you know, and a lot of people are blessed, you know, and they rest in, you know, studying for themselves and discovering for themselves by the inspiration that I share with them that God can speak to them, they don't need me, you know, they don't need video, you know, they don't have to watch one every day or whatever, but they can study and learn and talk to God himself and he will talk to them and God's honored that. You know, and in that way, I guess, that could be called a prophet, you know, if you wanted to, but the reality is is that people have expectations of what a prophet is that I'd say, don't put me in that office. <laughs> and the same thing was true about ministry was that I avoided being full-time ministry because I didn't like anything about being paid. I didn't like any way, shape, or form that I saw how the church dealt with the area of finances, tithing, and things that I studied scripture on and said, nah, that's not the way I read it. And so I didn't do it. And until I could find that satisfaction, that peace and comfort, I stayed out of ministry, direct ministry, meaning like being in charge of, quote unquote, the responsible part of being answerable to God for a ministry that I'm doing to the public for his name's sake and in his name, like Vidivo. Because Vidivo is a ministry of sharing Jesus in an intimate and personal way that you may not have thought of before and that you may not have related to Jesus in that way. But that's what we do. And so in presenting that ministry through 40 or more blogs and 40 or more uh, post, uh, posts, uh, websites and blogs and forums and, <laughs> and you name it, I got all over the web. But um, And then, you know, publishing, publishing and publications, all free, that um, in coming to that place and letting God lead and letting His Spirit provide, oh, it's hard, don't get me wrong. That means my wife and I suffer for lack of income in some ways. But in other ways, God has received all the glory and honor and praise. And that's why he's taking it around the world and taking it to such huge numbers, you know, recently. It was like, wow, what happened, Lord? How come you just decided to go into the thousands per day and the tens of thousands? And, you know, one of the forums that we have just went to 50,000 in six days. And I don't even want us to find out anymore how much it's going to do at the end of the month because I'm not going to check anymore. I quit checking. When it went 50,000 six days, I gave up and said, I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know. No more. I'm not looking. <laughs> but that's the point. You see, if you're sharing Jesus, 
in a personal, intimate way. And if you're relating factual data about the Bible and about God and about yourself, people want to know the truth. They want to know real stuff, not this phony stuff that some idiot running around says, I'm a prophet and tries to make himself sound spiritual and does all these, you know, gyrations and ovulations and coordinations and jumps up and down and gets excited and wears gold and does his dance and does his jiggalig and hoop de doo and who knows what else. Picks up a snake and gets bit and dies, you know. I mean, the dumb things that Christians do sometimes, when all you got to do is be real. You know, if you're real, God will use you when it's time. If you're real, God will speak to you when it's time. If you're real, God will reveal himself when it's time. And he will open your ears and you'll hear him talk. He'll open your eyes and you will... Ooh, that's the scary part, but yeah. That too, you know, you'll see him. <laughs> ooh, that's kind of serious. It happens. It doesn't happen often, but you know, when it does happen, you'll remember it for the rest of your life. And it will happen once or twice or maybe more for some of you. Who knows? Happened for Paul. He went to heaven, you know, had talked to Jesus about what his doctrine and dogma was, came back, you know. But the factual part of that is how intelligent our faith should be. It should be a practical reality of what God says, God does, and God will do. And so that's why we should not be wrapped up in emotion when it comes to our faith. You can be emotional about how you feel about God, but recognize their feelings. When it comes to faith, the facts of the reality of the Word of God being fulfilled are what faith is all about. It's not something like a belief system and it's not a belief. Believing is putting some kind of emotional spin on what the reality of dealing with a factual trans relationship is. You are actually having a transaction spiritually with God. That transaction means that you have a fact plus a fact equals a result. That's the way it works. That's what faith is. You know it'll happen because the fact plus the fact equals the result. That's the way it is. God does that. And it's not like name some promise and claim some fame and get some name on it, you know, and then try to make it yours and try to sign your name to it and do all these weird things that, you know, you've heard over the centuries. Those were ideas to give you an image of what the reality is. Relationship is simply, hey, God said it, I went and did it, and it worked. So, Christianity has always been that. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. If it works for you, do it. It's kind of like what I call placebo Christianity. You see, there's a part of baby Christians that's called placebo Christianity. That whatever they put their faith in works for them. Because it doesn't matter whether it was Christian or whatever it was. Because their faith is so much that they would make it seem like it worked because placebo effects do work. But when you finally get into intelligent faith, then God begins to speak to you. He begins to open up your ears and eyes and your soul and your heart to just what he wants for the rest of the world. And no offense to these false prophets running around or these well-intended Christians that think they are, but God doesn't want to condemn the world. God is constant in his latter days message of one thing one thing only and that is the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick raise the dead freely you've received freely give and repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand turn to god not repent of your sins and all this other weird stuff you know that you're trying to make righteous people to work their way to heaven but to turn to god and ask him to save you to turn to god and ask him to help you to turn to god because you're not going to get an answer from man they don't know why the weather is getting hotter they don't know why, you know, wars are happening and rumors of wars and things that are turmoils of nations and people that look like a good leader turn out to be a bad leader and a bad leader turns out to be, well, a bad leader. <laughs> but they don't know why it's happening. And yet, when you turn to God and ask Him, He doesn't worry or tell you to worry about those things. He tells you, come to me and I will give you rest. Come to me and I will give you peace. Come to me and I will give you eternal life. But the reality is, the message of all these prophets that are running around should simply be telling them to come to Jesus. Because that's what their message should be. And not, the sky is falling, or the end of the world. Sorry, can't go there, won't do it. Isn't about what God said. God said, come to me. And that's my word. Am I a prophet? Only God knows.